There are stubborn facts that animate the Syrian uprising. What I will do is that I will discuss some of these facts and I will talk a little bit about the um, uh, regional and international dimensions and then I'll discuss the dynamics of the uprising itself in Syria and uh, the reason for the current stalemate and I will end with where the uprising is headed in the near future. So the first uh, thing I want to say, which is basically my, um, my uh, 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 introduction, uh, I would like to talk about the um, uh, stubborn facts that animate the uprisings. I will discuss briefly uh, a few stubborn facts because we get a little bit, uh, I think, confused or lost sometimes when we are looking at the whole complex of factors. But there are some things that we should not, in my view, forget or set aside or um, uh, consider to be a thing of the past. The first thing is that we are witnessing today an opposition in Syria, not to what is happening since March 2011. We are witnessing an opposition to decades of dictatorship, not a year of repression. We cannot forget that even if the opposition has become problematic, even if the opposition is supported by countries that are themselves problematic in their foreign policies, even if all of these factors are taking place, we cannot forget that we have an opposition at heart, an opposition to four decades at least of uh, dictatorship in Syria. This cannot be compromised as a fact, no matter how the opposition is problematic. The second uh, stubborn fact that animates the Syrian uprising is that we can no longer, at the same time that we can no longer, we cannot forget that this is an opposition to four decades of dictatorship, the second point is that we can no longer take this uprising that's happening today for granted. In other words, we are no longer witnessing a clear-cut event where a pro-democracy movement is facing a dictatorship. Of course, the dictatorship, the dictatorship side of the formula is still there. But this has become a war of position in which the opposition's moral high ground has been diminished considerably. And we passed the point where the opposition can simply rely on the first point. That is, we passed the, the um, the period or the, we passed the point where the opposition can simply rely on the fact that it's fighting a dictatorship. That might have worked in other areas because perhaps of the length of time before the head of state departed or before the head of state was killed and so on and so forth. In the Syrian case, this protracted uprising created a situation where the opposition, and I'll talk about how, why, the opposition itself um, became uh, in various ways problematic. And we no longer have this uh, uh, situation where it's a clear-cut uprising against dictatorship. It's still an uprising against dictatorship, but not necessarily by pro-democracy forces if you consider the behavior of the SNC and some other groups, the Syrian National Council and some other groups in the Syrian opposition, including the states that support the opposition, including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, the United States, and some European countries. All of these countries have had problems in their own domestic and foreign policies and have failed to produce and support and end independent uprising with integrity. And this is why things began to fall apart on the side of the official opposition. There still is genuine opposition inside Syria and outside Syria, but it's not the one that is supported by the countries that I mentioned. The third fact that animates the Syrian uprising is the fact that supporters of regime change in Syria are perhaps one of the biggest um, opposition or impediment to regime change because of their own policies and human rights records. Whether we're talking about the Arab Gulf states, the conservative states, or Turkey, or the United States, they have all actually, or Israel by connection to some of these uh, states, all of these states have had their own violations of human rights at a very profound level, not at a superficial level. Uh, Israel, interestingly, in this case, is, is uh, uh, a little different because Israel is more ambivalent about regime change in Syria than the other countries that I mentioned, simply because Israel is not 
sure, or many Israeli officials or government um, strong men or women or uh, generals, they are not sure that the next formula in Syria or the next regime will be strong enough to protect its southern border. And that's a very interesting point because it sets Israel on one side and the, these other countries on the other. Nonetheless, the issue is uh, debatable inside Israel if you follow the Israeli newspapers. All these states, in other words, constitute the spearhead in some senses of counter-revolution in the region. So we have a revolution, but a lot of these states that I mentioned and others are concerned about where these uprisings are going, whether they will serve their interests or the interest of the people that are launching these uprisings. So this is the third uh, fact that animates the uprisings, the question of um, the support for some of these uprisings and the support for counter-revolution plays a role in animating the way many of us or most of us see these uprisings. And finally, uh, which is my closing point, but I'll start with it now, the fourth fact is that the uprising has been transformed, in Syria at least, from a legitimate domestic fight against dictatorship to an occasion for restructuring power relations in the region whether it is by the Arab conservative states themselves, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, whether it's by Turkey, whether it's by Israel, or whether it's by uh, some European countries and certainly the United States. So as a result of this, this is no longer about opposing the Syrian regime. Opposing the behavior of the Syrian regime for four decades does not require a rocket scientist or a human rights activist. The record speaks for itself. Anyone who is considered with democracy empowerment of groups and individuals and human rights and all of these nice labels should be naturally critical of the Syrian regime. But the game has become much more complex and the other side that is pushing for change is not necessarily much better in many ways. So the observers in the middle or the Syrians in the middle or non-Syrians are now looking at the situation whereby you have uh, a bad status quo and a bad alternative, and many of us are somewhat paralyzed in terms of what we do intellectually, politically, and even militarily, those of us who have guns. I don't have a gun. Definitely don't have a gun right now. <clears throat> and I don't have a gun when I'm not here, by the way. I don't like guns, personally. So these are the four facts uh, that animate the uprising. And I, well, the reason I'm saying this be is because every time we hit a, um, an impediment, people go back to the drawing board and try to reinvent and rethink everything without paying attention to these very consistent uh, four facts. Number one, the, the fact that we have a dictatorship for several decades, not a dictatorship for just a year. Number two, the opposition has lost a lot of credibility by be, being um, beholden and subordinated by, to other uh, players outside Syria. Number three, that the supporters of regime change in Syria, the countries that support regime change uh, themselves have been problematic historically and at the current moment in various ways, some more than others, of course. And finally, that this uprising is not really about Syria only anymore. So at this point, we have a regional and international and a local stalemate in Syria. The local stalemate is produced by the fact that neither the state or the regime in Syria nor the opposition is able to topple or eliminate the other. The regional stalemate is caused by the fact that we have a continuing balance of power, I guess, at some level, between Syria, Hezbollah, and uh, Iran on the one hand, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and other conservative states in the Arab world on the other. So that regional stalemate is uh, still on, active, as well as the local. Internationally, we have a stalemate between the US and some European countries on the one hand, and of course, uh, Russia and China on the other, with respect to the uh, situation in Syria. Not because of love of Syria, of course, the Chinese and the Russian consider Syria to be uh, the major ally that they have in that region and absent this particular regime, they basically might lose leverage vis-a-vis -a, -vis a lot of the conflicts and a lot of the contention that takes place in the region. 
So it is not because they necessarily just support the regime itself, but if you consider a counterfactual, in the absence of this Syrian regime, the connection to the region, or to the Levant in particular, uh, will be lost for um, Russia and China. Iran is not as close as uh, Syria for these two countries, and therefore there's a lot of uh, interest in, in supporting the Syrian regime, plus it, there's a lot of interest in uh, this alliance in terms of their ability to leverage certain uh, uh, conflicts vis-a-vis -vis the other players involved. So because of this local, regional, international stalemate, we basically have this kind of problematic stasis that we are stasis lack of movement that we are witnessing right now, and it, I think it will continue for some time before uh, something happens that I think many of us do not anticipate. Uh, there might be a spillover effect that is much more serious than what we have seen in Lebanon. There might be a regional spillover effect, and uh, there, there could be potentially a movement on the Iran's Israel American front in terms of the uh, alleged nuclear um, power plants uh, of Iran, we do not know, but we do have right now a kind of stasis that is very difficult to uh, predict what is, what is going to happen. These questions, I think, are less important than the other questions that I would address right now, uh, which have to do with the causes of the uh, uprising. I will focus on the structural causes of the emergence of social discontent that produced, uh, of course, mass discontent and then mass mobilization and even militarization. I will discuss this for a minute and then I'll discuss uh for may, maybe more than a minute, and then I will discuss the uh, resilience of the regime. Why is the regime still alive? And I will also discuss the limits of this resilience. And then we'll talk a little bit about where this is going, even though I hope to talk about this more during the Q&A period. Uh, in my view, uh, and my lifetime work has been on uh, the political economy of authoritarian resilience. How do authoritarian regimes continue to stay in power? One of the ways that they do this, and certainly in Syria, is that they shift alliances from the leftist, labor-oriented coalitions that they uh, embraced in the post-colonial period, or somewhat uh, after the post-colonial period, until the 70s and 80s when these formulas, state labor alliances, begin to break down along with the breakdown of the state public sector connected to the labor unions and the, uh, what we call the populist coalitions. When these formulas begin to break down, and we'll not talk about the reasons or the international influence, ultimately when these union, when these coalitions begin to break down, the state left state labor coalitions, we see an emergence of uh, a shift from these coalitions to state business coalitions that animate the, the animated the past 30 or 25 years in most Arab countries and certainly in Syria. This shift in Syria took place in the mid-1980s when the public sector was failing and when the government became be, was almost bankrupt in 1986. It began to switch alliances to business actors, select business actors. These uh, alliances made up of state officials and select big business actors ended up over the years forming networks, literally economic networks that bring state officials and business actors together that hijacked, to use a very blunt word, hijacked the process of economic development and economic change, and even though Syria was a socialist country by constitution, or in terms of what the constitution says, the pattern of economic change followed neoliberal patterns that was that were patterns that were hegemonic in, Syria, in the Middle East and globally. These two and a half decades of economic change and development along neoliberal terms ended up creating problematic consequences for all Syrians who depended on a state-centered economic system, who depended, on, who depended on distributive policies, and gradually, but certainly over the years, most Syrians were disenfranchised. Most Syrians were placed outside the system gradually or up in absolute terms as a result of these policies that reflected those social alliances that were not just happening in Syria, 
but definitely happened in Syria. As a result of these policies that supported business, that supported the metropolitan cities as opposed to the countryside, that supported a certain layer of business, not even all of the business community, because the state could not absorb the entire business community. They had to be selective in who to choose to ally itself with and who to support so that it doesn't get overtaken by the business community. The ultimate outcome was this disenfranchisement and social polarization at two levels. By 2010, we had two uh, kinds of polarization that animated uh, the Syrian scene. Vertical polar polarization between the rich and the poor, whereby more than 30% of the Syrian public were either under the poverty, poverty line or struggling, and the rest the other 30% or 40% even were barely making ends meet with a very small percentage able to actually continue and prosper. This, so, this social polarization uh, created large sectors of uh, Syrians that uh, were uh, disenfranchised and expressed their discontent in muted ways between 2000 and 2010. The other polarization that took place is not vertical, it's horizontal and it actually has to do with the polarization that took place between the countryside and the city. Over the years, the investments were made in the city, they were neglected uh, and the investments in the countryside were either diminished or eliminated. So we ended, ha we ended up having a huge disparity between the countryside and the metropolitan major cities in Syria as a result of this investment pattern. So the countryside was impoverished and destitute at the same time that the vertical polarization created a large uh, disenfranchised sector of the Syrian society. The combination of these two polarizations brought together most Syrians in opposition to the state for so many years at this point. However, this opposition was not enough to produce mass mobilization. In other words, mass discontent does not produce mass mobilization automatically. That's why social scientists cannot predict revolutions. But they produce the structural readiness to go to the streets. What was needed is a some sort of a spark, and of course Abu Azizi and what happened in Egypt provided that spark, and we saw Syrians for the first time go to the streets en masse in a consistent and sustained way. Which is interesting because had this not happened in Tunisia and Egypt, the Syrian mass mobilization would have not happened at this very time because Syria, despite everything that I'm trying to say right now, is not in the same category as Egypt, at least in terms of the uh, level of social discontent, at least in socio-economic terms, in relation to Egypt, not in, rela not in relation to absolute uh, standards. So, uh, in other words, the uprising in Syria, or the, uh, uh, the uh, appetite for social mobilization or, and for mass mobilization in the streets was not ripe in Syria in 2011, not ripe yet. It would have happened anyway, but not exactly at that point. So the combination of these two polarizations produced this mass discontent. There is one item that nobody talks about because it's not sexy to talk about this item, but this item relates to the uh, major drought that took place in Syria in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. This drought and the countryside added to the misery and destitution of the countryside because it led to, besides the impoverishment of the countryside further, the further impoverishment of the countryside, it led to a migration, um, or the migration of at least 1.2 to 1.5 million Syrians from the countryside to the cities. Now, you can tell me that, that Aleppo, and Egypt, uh, sorry, Aleppo and Damascus have not suffered as much as the other smaller cities, and that's exactly the case, but there are reasons for this. These people that migrated to the metropolitan cities, including Homs and Hama, not just Aleppo and uh, Damascus, in the major cities like Aleppo and Damascus, the standard of living was high enough to be able to absorb this migration. The capital flow was high enough to be able to deal with this uh, uh, influx of, of, of uh, uh, countryside dwellers. The infrastructure of these major cities was sufficient to absorb this migration. In addition to this, 
the money that came from Iraq after 2003 that was thrown all over the main cities of Syria, specifically Damascus and Aleppo, and the kind of business and energy and activity that this brought, uh, especially in terms of real estate, allowed the Syrian metropolitan cities not only to withstand this uh, migration, but also to prosper, which is what explains the very slow incorporation of Damascus and Aleppo into the uprising, not because they liked the regime, but because they were doing okay for the most part, and some were doing extremely well. Of course, the upper and middle classes lived mostly in those two cities. Now, the effect of this migration on the smaller cities and the smaller towns, whether we're talking about Dara, Homs, Idlib, Hama, and so on, was detrimental. Therefore, you see that the strongest part of the uprising is either in the countryside or in the smaller cities. And that reflects the structural discontent or the structural causes that produce discontent in those places. Now, I'm not saying that these um, factors explain the Syrian uprising. Of course, without considering oppression for decades, we, don't, we can't really understand this. But what I'm trying to say is that without considering the structural causes that are political economic and the alliances behind them, we will never have an adequate understanding of the uprisings. Because oppression alone does not produce uprisings as we have seen over the past six, seven, eight decades. So uh, it's important to focus on this because it's usually neglected in the mainstream and it's usually, as I said, not a sexy topic and it's considered, that it's considered extra or academic, but it is not. And the reason I focus on it is not because uh, I study it. The other reason I focus on it is because we are going to return to this problem in about a year or two. Uh, if, if we haven't gotten there already. In other words, once the dust settles in Egypt and Tunisia, Libya and Yemen and Bahrain is are kind of odd, and Syria perhaps in a couple of years, there will be a return to the question of how do we rebuild these countries? How, on what economic system do we rely? What are the relationships between uh, the state and capital in those countries and state and labor? And then the state as a whole and the international community, specifically the international financial institutions. And when we ask these questions in the future, the best answers, best in quotation marks, are going to come from people with money and institutions with money and capability to fund reform and reconstruction processes. And they will fund their own allies that are usually the same people that helped produce the discontent that produced the uprisings in the first place. So we're going to go back to this topic, and that's why it's very important to understand it and not to think that it's just an academic topic. It's just not important right now because, because people listen to it and they think, oh, it's the economy, these, these issues are, are not as important as what's happening on the streets right now, and I beg to differ. So I, will, I think I, I should uh, wrap up a little bit, so I'll go very fast right now. Um, so this is the major reason uh, for my paper, and it's broken down in my paper, but I will move now to the question of regime resilience. A lot of people wonder why Syria is still alive as a regime today, as opposed to the other cases where the head of state ultimately departed and there was a compromise of sorts, which didn't lead to democracy and it was never going to lead to democracy, but people viewed it as some sort of a transformation. The, the reason is that the Syrian regime, as opposed to the Tunisian and Egyptian regimes, is actually incredibly cohesive at the top. In other words, the institutions that make up the Syrian regime are far less autonomous than the institutions that made up the Egyptian or the Tunisian regime to a lesser extent. In other words, the army in Egypt has its own semi-autonomy, if you will, and was able at some point to come to the president and say, you have to leave in order for us to preserve the regime. There's no other way out. In Syria, this scenario is impossible. There isn't a, an independent autonomous institution of the army that can actually approach Assad and the leadership and say, if you leave, we might be spared. That is not even a possibility, not because the, the, the army leaders cannot come to Assad and say this, but because there's no such thing as army leaders in the real sense. 
as autonomous army leaders or chief of staff or uh, army generals that are independent of the top leadership. Syrian society is made up of minorities, whether ethnic groups or sects. The regime has been able to exploit the situation in such a way where most of the minorities are actually supportive of the regime, even if they are not necessarily pro-regime, but they're supportive of the status quo, because they see that their fate will be better under this regime as opposed to a majoritarian Sunni leadership, even if it's not Islamist. So there is this kind of structural situation in Syria that has been exacerbated by the regime over the years, just like what Saddam Hussein tried to do in Iraq, but he didn't do it as successfully as the Syrian regime. This kind of heterogeneity in society and cohesive regime at the top prevented the kind of outcomes that we have seen elsewhere and produced this protracted uh, uprising in Syria. Now, uh, the uh, opposition, I can talk about the opposition more in the Q&A and the role of Turkey and the role of Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia in basically um, undermining the ability of the opposition to actually make a difference in Syria. The opposition headed by the S Syrian National Council under the leadership, or the, sorry, under the uh, patronage of these Arab countries that I mentioned and Turkey, failed in producing an independent opposition that can bring together all other parts of the opposition in order to, find this, to fight this cohesive and very strong regime. In fact, these countries that I mentioned have diminished the credibility of the opposition by over interfering in its affairs in order to serve their own interest before they serve the interest of the of Syrians. And even the supporters of the SNC inside Syria know this, but they have no other option but to support the opposition outside Syria because they are actually isolated. I will discuss this, uh, ho I hope, a little bit more if you have questions. But ultimately, uh, I just wanted to say that um, internationally and regionally speaking, the Syrian uprising is moving into a territory that has very little to do with Syria, unfortunately. Has a lot to do with the United States, Israel, Turkey, the Arab conservative states with a lot of power through, finan through financing and, and, and oil wealth. Uh, in that sense, the Syrian uprising is really about these factors as much as it is about fighting dictatorship. And of course, the Russians and the Chinese are not playing a great role in any case, but they really have uh, uh, not done that just as with the other countries for a long time either. My point is that we should uh, be a little bit less idealistic when we look at the Syrian dictatorship in the sense that, yes, the Syrian dictatorship needs to be fought because of its dictatorship, but let's not be um, naive about who's fighting and what kind of values they represent and what kind of interests they represent. Many people do not like the dictatorship of Syria, of the Syrian regime in Syria, but they also do not like the dictatorship of Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, and the United States in the region. So we're not comparing here good and bad. We're comparing two options that have a lot of problems on either side. And that's why it's a difficult situation. Thank you.